Okay, and we are live. Hello, web shadowers. Thank you all for joining our session today. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Miracle Anakute, who will be presenting to us about neurosurgery. As always, the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end of the session. And please stick around for an announcement about our April roundups that are gonna be happening this weekend. With that being said, uh, Dr. Anakute, you can get started whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today with the Web Shadowers group. Thank you to the Web Shadowers group for giving me the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, I wasn't sure how uh, the range of the audience would be today. So I assume there are going to be medical students and quite a bit of undergraduate uh, medical students as well and undergrad students. In addition to internationals and even some high school students would be my guest. So I've really tailored this talk to be very broad in trying to discuss with you all what neurosurgery is about. What is, what is the bread and the butter of neurosurgery? The things that you will see on a day-to-day -day basis as a neurosurgeon. And hopefully this will continue to spike your interest in neurosurgery and turn you all into future neurosurgeons someday. Like I said, my name is Dr. Miracle Anokute. I'm the PGY4 neurosurgery resident at Indiana University School of Medicine. I have no disclosures uh, to disclose to you guys today. So how this talk is going to go is that we're going to go over a few case studies to begin with. I think I have about four or five case studies to go over with you guys. I really want this to be very interactive. So please ask questions. Please answer my questions when I ask them. Um, and Sophia will be coordinating all of those um, during the talk. After we get done with the talk, um, I'll open it up to general questions. So if you have questions about neurosurgery itself, the pathway to get into neurosurgery, which is something I'm gonna discuss as we go along, uh, feel free to ask those questions. Or if you have just questions in general, I'm more than happy to answer those for you. So let's talk neurosurgery. So neurosurgery uh, is a great quote by one of the fathers of neurosurgery, Dr. Wilder Penfield. And he stated that the brain is the organ of destiny. It holds within its humming mechanism secrets that will determine the future of the human race. How exciting is that, right? I mean, as a neurosurgeon, you get to explore the brain on a significant basis and more so than anybody else in this world. Um, and there's so much about the brain itself that we still don't fully understand, but yet here we are going into, into and out of it, taking tumors out and treating patients and helping patients get better, but there's still so much that we need to learn. And there's so many secrets within the brain itself that it's exciting. And I can't wait to see what you all do um, in the future um, in discovering these areas of the brain. But then the question becomes, but what about the spine? Father Penfield never talked about the spine. So hopefully someone of, some, one of you will find those humming mechanisms and secrets within the spine itself and be a future spine surgeon like I hope to be. So let's talk about neurosurgery in general. So some of you, this might be the first time you've heard about neurosurgery. Um, so what is neurosurgery? It's a surgical treatment of neurological disorders of the brain and the spine. It involves the treatment of tumors, both metastatic tumors, which means these are tumors that come from somewhere else and, tra and travel to the brain itself, and also primary brain and spine tumors, which are tumors that come from either the brain itself or the parenchyma around the brain. We also treat vascular pathology, which involves things like aneurysms, which are areas of the blood vessels in the brain that become weak and then form outpouchings that can actually bleed out and cause significant neurological deficits. We treat arterial venous malformations, also known as AVMs, and we also treat arterial venous fistulas as well. So there are multiple vascular pathologies within the brain itself that we treat. One of them that's not mentioned here is one called Moya Moya disease, which is a very, very interesting pathology uh, that affects the cerebral circulation. We also treat peripheral nerve disorders, and these include peripheral nerve entrapments. So if you've ever heard of somebody say, oh, my carpal tunnel hurts, I have carpal tunnel syndrome, that's one of those things that we treat in neurosurgery, and that is called a median neuropathy that occurs at the wrist itself. We treat something called cubital tunnel syndrome, which is a neuropathy of the ulnar nerve that occurs at the elbow where the uh, ulnar nerve gets entrapped in that area. We treat tumors of the peripheral nervous system. So these include peripheral nerve sheet tumors, schwannomas, and we also do nerve transfers for patients who have um, brachial plexus disorders, especially even in pediatric patients who 
Some might be born with the uh, inability to really use their arms and we can use uh, nerve transfers to help augment those nerves that are non-functional and help bring about function in the arm of these children. We also do functional neurosurgery, uh, which is a very exciting field um, in neurosurgery that involves the treatment of epilepsy. So patients who have seizures, we treat those patients surgically. Deep brain stimulation. Now, deep brain stimulation is something that has been used for several years in the treatment of a disease called Parkinson's disease, uh, but it also has applications in other disorders and is now being used in some treatments of psychiatric disorders, which is a very exciting field in neurosurgery that is now just really fully being explored. We treat spine patients. So this involves patients who have degenerative spine issues, which means that over time there's wear and tear on the spine that leads to degeneration. And that leads to disorder in the balance of the spine, compression of the nerves themselves and damage to the nerves that leads to significant impairment in the livelihood of our patients. And that can deal with back pain, nerve pain, also known as neuropathy or radiculopathy. The types of surgeries we do for the spine include minimal invasive spine, where we make really small incisions to access areas of the spine to help treat spinal disease. Um, but also minimal invasive in that we do the least amount of tissue destruction to get to that area. So it's not about the size of the incision, it's about the amount of tissue that's destroyed or damaged to get to the area of interest or of pathology. We also treat deformity spine. So these involve patients who have significant scoliosis, um, that need correction in their balance and also in their alignment to allow for functionality. And we also treat spinal oncology, which involves the tumors that go to the spine themselves. And we also do pediatric spine surgery. Lastly, there's pediatric neurosurgery, which is an offshoot of neurosurgery, a branch of neurosurgery itself, that deals with everything pediatrics. So everything you see above here, we do that in pediatrics as well. But the biggest one that we deal with is hydrocephalus, which is also known as water on the brain. It's where the fluid filled spaces in the brain are pretty significant and large uh, with uh, ventricular fluid or cerebral spinal fluid. And that leads to impairment and function of the child or of the adult as well. And so we treat those with shunts or uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomies to help divert the spinal fluid. And I see there's a question in the chat here. So I'm gonna go take a peek at that. So the donor nerves come from the patient itself. So they're not coming from a cadaver. So we find functional nerves within the brachial plexus and we take small branches of those to match up with the um, non-functioning nerve to try to give growth across that connection to allow for function in that patient. So good question, Sophia. Uh, well, whoever asked it, thanks for sharing, Sophia. So now that you guys have seen how broad neurosurgery is, there's so much that you can do in neurosurgery that you don't really have to limit yourself, even if you think of it as just a subspecialty itself. There's still quite a bit of neurosurgery that you can do. So how do you get to becoming a neurosurgeon? So the pathway to neurosurgery begins early. So determine your interests early. Sometimes it, you can determine those interests late, but earlier is better than later. Uh, but there are people who have been very successful um, who have developed their interests later and have gone on to become great neurosurgeons. But the best is to try to determine your interests early, whether this is in college or this is in medical school. I developed my interest in first and second year of medical school, so not as early as college. Uh, study and perform well in your exams. And this is geared to everybody. You're going to take exams all the way from university, from high school to university, to medical school, to residency. So the exams don't stop, okay? So you need to develop your study habits early, learn how to study, learn how to approach exams and do well in those exams so that you have a leg up whenever you go in to start applying to neurosurgery. One of the biggest things that I think is very important is to find a mentor and shadow them. And you guys are sort of doing that with the web shadowing, but you, you should find somebody that's close to you or around your area that you can interact with, ask questions that may be in an academic department as well. It's so you can learn more about neurosurgery, learn what you need to do to be successful in, in your steps of becoming a neurosurgeon as well. Research. So this is a question I get all the time. How much research should I be doing? Well, if you're in college, you, I mean, undergrad, you don't need a ton of research to do neurosurgery. You just need broad areas 
um, to develop your interests, like I said early. But when you get to medical school, you do need some research to apply for neurosurgery to um, help you understand the field itself. You know, the field of neurosurgery is an evolving science. So we need researchers out there who are going to take the charge and help us develop the next steps in neurosurgery itself, where this is basic science research and translating that to clinical research, or uh, it's just clinical research and identifying the things that we do now that we could improve on or things that we do now that we probably shouldn't still be doing if it doesn't work for our patients. Now, if you're a medical student, this is very important. Try to schedule your third and your fourth year rotations to maximize match potential and also interviews. This is a big deal because you wanna make sure that everything's ready to go for your residency applications by the time the bills are due. So if you schedule your rotations appropriately, you get your away rotations at different institutions, which is difficult to do now due to COVID, but I think some institutions are starting to open up to allow people to come in and, and, um, and perform a rotation or an ex externship where they uh, get to see the program, but also the program gets to see the applicant. I think those are very key to get those scheduled early on as soon as possible and to maximize how you schedule those so that when you do your interviews, you are um, ranked to match or maximizing the best way to match into neurosurgery. So how do you apply to neurosurgery? Well, you have to get through undergrad, then get into med school, you have to do some research, you have to do those away rotations we talked about, an audition for a spot in neurosurgery. You have to take these wonderful examinations called the USMLE Step 1, Step 2. Um, and these are very important because they help us in ranking you um, for as a neurosurgery applicant um, and are also the way to get your foot in the door. You need a network. And the way you network is by doing research and getting into conferences and going to go meet neurosurgeons out there, finding a mentor to talk to. That's how you network. And then doing well in interview season and interviews. So making sure that you interview well and you practice your interviews. I see there's another question in the chat. So the research that I did while I was in med school was actually on corneas. Um, I was looking at subbasal um, nerve fibers to the cornea itself. Um, and that was a basic science research project that took years and didn't get published until I think right at the beginning of my, actually second or third year of my residency. So nothing to do with neurosurgery except for the innervation of the cornea and nerves. That's the research I did while I was, I was in, um, in undergrad and in med school. And then in medical school, as a second and third year medical student, I did a lot of clinical research on um, aneurysms um, and treating aneurysms endovascularly. So nothing to do with spine, which is what I'm interested in now and have been interested in since I started residency. But in medical school, I thought I was going to go into vascular neurosurgery. So there, your, your interest should be broad. You'll find things that you love and things that you don't love. And you do research in things that you're interested in and, and find out if that's something for you. So good question. All right, so neurosurgery residency itself. So it's a seven-year residency after you get done with your four years of medical school and your undergrad, okay? So it's a long road to this point. You have your intern year where you do neurosurgery itself, um, at least at our program, that is how our structure is. You do neurosurgery, you're operating in the operating room with somebody above you. Um, we do neurocritical care where you're in the ICU taking care of our post-operative patients and also any sick patients, such as stroke patients that come into the hospital. You do a neuroradiology rotation where you really get to learn the anatomy and the pathology that you see on radiographic scans. And you do neuropathology where you get to see the, the molecular and the cellular markers um, of the tumors that you take out in the operating room. Then your PGY2, which is your postgraduate year two to four, is when you actually do neurosurgery and are in the operating room pretty much all the time. You go do clinic as well. And then when PGY5 years or research year, which is a year where you can, at least in our program here, you're able to do research, uh, whether it's 
basic science research or clinical research, but you can also tailor that year to whatever your career aspirations are and do things that are of great interest to you in neurosurgery. Then you have your PGY-6 year, which is your chief year of neurosurgery, uh, where you are the one that runs the service and are in charge of all of the patients, and you have to focus on your surgical armamentarium at that year. And then your PGY-7 year here is where you have an enfolded fellowship where you can do a fellowship in spine, skull base, vascular, neuro-oncology, and branch out into all those different subspecialties of neurosurgery. Now I see there's another question here. What is the best way to approach a doctor and ask to shadow? It's very simple. The way I did it was if I was in that doctor's office and they were my doctor, I'd say, hey, I'm interested in medicine. I would love to learn more about what you do. Can I shadow you? Done. If you're not in person with that doctor, pick up the phone and call the physicians in your area and say, hey, I'm interested in medicine. I would love to follow you. Would you be willing to have me in your clinic on this day or that day for a few hours? Done. There, are, It's very rare that a physician will say no to somebody who's interested in coming in to shadow them. Most doctors are, are very happy to have people that are interested in the field that want to follow in their footsteps as well. It's a great question. So now that we've talked about all the different aspects of neurosurgery, why don't we jump into some cases? Now, these cases are going to go like this. I'm going to tell you about how the patient presents, what their examination is, and then I'm going to ask you a question as to what do you want to do next? This is kind of how our boards go, actually. Some of our mock oral boards will go like this. And this is a great way to teach people, you know, what to expect when they walk into ER and what neurosurgery is about. And then we'll go over these cases. And then once we're done with the cases, we'll open it up to more questions for um, things that are in general about neurosurgery. All right, here we go. So the first case is about traumatic brain injury. You have a 21-year-old male that's coming to the ER. You get called by the ER doctor. Hey, there's a patient here. He's got a gunshot wound, GSW, to the left lateral orbit and exiting the left parietal skull. So it's coming in left orbit and then exiting out right over here, coming out. Cool. You're like, all right, well, I'm the new neurosurgery doctor here in town. I'm the, I'm the intern or the resident. And you ask them, you know, what's their exam? Well, they get respond to you, they're a GCS 7T. And you're like, oh, man, what does that mean? Well, the GCS is the Glasgow Coma Scale or score. And what that tells us is just a basic understanding of the function of the human brain. Are, is the person able to open their eyes? So that's E for eye opening response. Are they able to give us a verbal response? And that ranges from scores of one to five. And then there's a motor response that you can elicit on a patient that ranges from one to six. The lowest score you can get on the GCS score is a three and the highest is a 15. Whenever you see a T on the GCS score, that means that the patient is intubated. So they call you and they say the patient's a GCS 7T. Then you ask them, what do you mean by 7T? Tell me the different areas. What's the eye opening response? Well, the eyes closed. Okay, so E1. They're intubated because there's a T, so VT, and then M5, which means that they're localized on the left. What does that mean? That means that when you come over to their right side and you pinch them as hard as you can, on their right side, their left arm comes up and comes up to the to grab you on the right. You pinch them on the on the on the left side, and their right arm crosses over and comes over. So that's called localizing. You're crossing midline, um, and that tells you that there's still functional brain in that area. Well, you have to understand the brain itself. So the left side of the brain, in general, right? The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So you go down, you see the patient, and the exam's the same. Their eyes are closed when you push on them. They're intubated, so they can't really talk to you. And they're localizing on their left side, which means that they're still moving the left side of their body. So what do you do next for that patient? What do you guys want to do? And I'll pause here for some answers. What are you guys thinking?
check vitals. Okay, I like that. The vitals are stable, blood pressure stabilized, trauma team has been there and they've, they made sure they're oxygenating okay. Get a CT scan. So that's very broad. So what kind of CT do you want? Do you want a CT of the chest? Do you want a CT of the head? Do you want a CT of the spine? What are you guys thinking? Head CT, that's very correct. So next thing you wanna do is you go down, you see the patient, right? So you've examined the patient, you've gotten a history and the exam correlates to what you were told. You've seen the injury itself. And you, what you wanna do next, you wanna get a head CT. So by the time you get that in the ER, most of the time they've already stabilized the patient enough for them to transfer to the CT scanner to get a scan of the head. So let's take a look at that scan. So this is a CT scan, and it's a CT of the head without contrast. So just a teaching point here, when we look at CT scans and somebody asks you, hey, what's on this CT? Well, the way to interpret that is to ask yourself, well, what kind of scan is it? It's a CT scan. CT of what? CT of the head. So what area of the body are you scanning? And whether it has contrast or no contrast. So this is without contrast. And then what kind of cut is it? So this is an axial cut of the skin of the head itself. So the cuts are going through like this back and forth. And then there is something called a sagittal scan that goes up and down like this. And then there is a coronal scan that goes from front to back or back to front. So if you look at the scan, we'll play it again. You can see that there's bone here. This is the skull itself. These are the ears on either side. The light gray that you see here, that's brain. This is brain here. And so you can see brain here. You can see that there's something abnormal here as compared to here, right? So you look for symmetry on every scan that you look at, you know, and see if there is some sort of asymmetry or there's something on one side that's not on the other side. Now, just for reference, this is the right side and this is the left side. You can see down here that there's a lot of crowding. I'm gonna go back just a little bit here. You can see that there's a little bit of shift over this way to the contralateral side. And then you see here that there's blood here, which is bright. And as you come up, You can see that there's an open skull fracture here where the bullet has exited out, okay? So then the question was asked, how do you know if you need contrast versus no contrast? That's a very good question. In the acute phase, you don't typically get contrast because you just wanna see quickly the anatomy of the brain itself and get them in the scanner and get a scan as quickly as possible so you can see the bone and just the gross anatomy of the brain itself. Now at hospitals, at least at our institution, what we typically do is we do a trauma protocol where we actually do give contrast to some patients, but only to certain areas of the brain, uh, certain areas of the body, um, depending on the presentation of the patient. So it all depends on the patient presentation. So for example, if this patient was in a car accident and had a spinal fracture, we would give contrast through the um, blood vessels to take a look at the blood vessels going into the brain itself through the spine. This would include the vertebral arteries and also the carotid arteries to ensure that there is no vascular injury to those vessels themselves. Um, and so we would also do CT angiograms, which involve con giving contrast to these patients to better uh, visualize the blood vessels and ensure that there is no vascular injury. In this patient, though, when you're typically getting a head CT, you don't want to give contrast right away because you worry about the blood flowing through the blood vessels with contrast in them, masking a bleed that you can see interparenchymally. So you really just want to be able to see that architecture of the blood clot itself and not be worried about, is that a blood vessel or is that blood in the brain itself. So we got a CT of the head and it showed that this patient had midline shift 
compression of the cisterns and they had a poor neurological examination. So what do you guys think we should do now? Should we say, all right, we've done everything we can do. Let's just stop. Do we say, well, we'll just take them up to the ICU. Let's watch them overnight and see how they do. Or do you say, let's take them to the operating room and get that, you know, get them decompressed and, and take care of the lesion that we see there. What do you guys think? I agree. Take him to the operating room. So you want to take this patient to the operating room because they have a poor neurological examination, but it's still a salvageable neurological examination because they're still moving part of their body, right? Um, there's an obvious lesion there that is causing somewhat compression over the brain itself. And you also have this fracture here uh, with what looks like brain herniating out of it. So take the patient to the operating room is absolutely the right answer. So let's take a look at what we did. <laughs> Call Dr. Miracle. That, that, that happened too. So what we did then is I took him to the operating room and did a decompressive hemicraniectomy, which means we take off half, basically close to half of the skull off. And this is what we found. So you can see the brain itself is pretty bruised. Um, you can see blood pumping from where one of those blood vessels had been hit by a bullet. And what we do is we take down the dura, which is the covering of the brain itself, and we tack these backwards to allow the brain to kind of swell out of that area. By taking the skull off, we decrease the pressure in the head. The other thing that we do is we also place a monitor into the brain itself to help measure the pressures in the head. And as you can see here, you can see how this is all opened back up again. The skull is off. And you can see the brain is herniating outwards, and we have this monitor system that is placed into the parenchyma of the brain to help monitor the pressure. And you can see the shift has gotten better. There's good symmetry back and forth, except for the obvious bleed that's still there. So this is called a decompressive hemicraniectomy. We use these for our trauma patients who have intracranial lesions um, with a devastating or a salvageable neurological injury. And we take them to the operating room, we decompress them, take out part of their skull to allow for the brain to swell out of the defect and not compress their remaining functional neurological structures. So that's just one of the, one of the, uh, bread and butter cases that we do in neurosurgery. So I see there's another question here. Do you have to shave the patient's hair to do so? The answer is yes. What you don't want is for, you know, the blood that was outside of the patient's head from the bullet exiting. Maybe the patient fell on the ground and there's dirt in the hair. You don't want that to be anywhere near your surgical lesion. And also it helps you to identify where you're going to make your incision. So typically I do shave the hair off. How do you put back the dura? Do you have to suture it? So in this case, the answer is no, you don't put the dura back because if you suture it back over, you're going to prevent the brain from swelling the way that it needs to, and it swells backwards or to the contralateral side and causes compression of those functional structures. So you don't sew the dura back. You put a, a, a uh, um, what we call here seprofilm that goes on top of it to help um, just kind of keep the dura in similar structure that it was before and prevent it from sticking to the rest of the um, of the myocutaneous flap that you see here, which is the temporalis muscle and then the skin of the of the scalp itself, because you want to come back later on and you want to give that patient back their skull, right? You don't want somebody walking around with half a skull gone uh, for years and years. So what we do, and I actually took this patient, uh, this patient actually went back re, um, a little while back um, and they had their skull pulled back on. Um, so you want to make sure that you save as much of that skull as possible. And if you're not able to save it, reprint a 3D printed skull for that patient so you can reattach it. Very good questions. Thank you, everyone. So if somebody's in extreme pain, you want to make sure you treat that pain and give them the medications that are needed for them to be able to be comfortable enough for you to be able to get them to the scanner. All right. And if somebody's screaming in extreme pain, that typically tells you that 
they have a salvageable injury because they are verbally, you know, uh, verbalizing that they are in pain and they're yelling. And so it means that you're more likely to have a good outcome if they're coming in screaming in pain versus somebody coming in who's already comatose and not talking at all. All right, so let's go to the next case. So you have the 60-year-old female with asthma, hypothyroidism, and she comes into your clinic and she says, hey, doc, you know, I had these seizures um, and they took me to the, uh, to the scanner and they got a CT scan and it showed this thing that they call a frontal meningioma. I don't know what that really is. Anyways, doc, you know, I, they gave me this medication called Keppra. I haven't had a seizure since, but man, I just... I just want to know what's going on. What, what should I do? So patient comes in, you talk to them, you get a good history from them. And then you go ahead and the next step is always to do a physical examination. So this patient has no cranial nerve deficit. She's five out of five strength in her bilateral upper extremities and lower extremities. So this is the medical research council grading for strength examination in the United States. Um, and so it goes from zero to five. So zero out of five means they're not doing anything. Five out of five means they're full strength. Okay. So this patient's come to you. What do you want to do next? What are you guys thinking? So good question about how you put the skull back on. You actually put it with screws and plates to hold it together to the old one. So what do you guys think about this patient? So head CT is a good idea, right? You think there's a lesion there, so you want to get a head CT. That's a good idea. A neurological examination. You already got the neurological examination. But going to the CT scan, you know, the CT is very good at showing you gross structure of the brain, the bone itself, and the fluid-filled spaces of the brain. But it doesn't really show you the tracts in the brain or the, the fine detail of the brain itself. So somebody said MRI. That's absolutely correct. So now we're going to get an MRI of the brain. Does anybody want it with contrast or without contrast? What are you guys thinking? Well, without contrast... That's a good idea. It'll give you a lot of information about the anatomy of the brain, but it won't really show you if there is a significant abnormality there that has contrast enhancement, which then changes your differential diagnosis. So yeah, more people are saying with contrast. I 100% agree with you all. You want to get an MR of the brain with and without contrast because you want to compare what it looks like without any contrast going into it to something that has contrast going in. So you can see the full structure itself. So this is the MRI of the brain with and without contrast. So again, whenever you're seeing a scan, you wanna say, hey, what kind of scan is this? It's an MRI of the brain. Is it with or without contrast? Well, it's with both. I'm just not showing you the one without contrast on this scan. How do you know it's with contrast? You can see this white stuff here that's enhancing and the blood vessels here and blood vessels there and the blood vessels here. That's how you know it's with contrast. Um, and what kind of cut is it? Well, it's an ax cut, right? Kind of going through like this, going back and forth. And what cuts over here? It's a coronal cut going from front to back or back to front. So what do we look for whenever you look at any scan? You want to look for symmetry or asymmetry, right? So let's look over here. You see the gyro pattern with the sulcal pattern here, gyro part and sulcal pattern going back and forth. But what do you see over here? You see something that shouldn't be there, right? It's not on this side, but it's over here. It's pretty large, it contrast enhances, and it's caused a change in the morphology of the rest of the brain in that area. And then when you get back here, motor's area, you start seeing that you get back to that normal sulcogyral pattern that you see there. So let's look at the coronal scan. The coronal scan shows you this lesion that comes from the dura itself. It's invading the brain, parenchyma itself, pushing the rest of the brain away. Well, it may have some invasion around here, but mostly it's coming from this dural leaflet covering. And it looks like it's going into this structure here. Does anybody know what this structure is? 
It runs from anterior to posterior and drains most of the supratentorial portion of the brain. So that structure is called the super, superior sagittal sinus. And somebody asked a question, is it standard to do CT with and without contrast? You can do a CT with and without contrast. There's no standard to it. It all depends on what you're looking for and why you're doing the scan. Um, I would not do a CT here because it won't give me the fine detail that you see here in this scan. All right, so now that you have gotten the, the MRI uh, for this patient, what do you wanna do next for them? Do you wanna watch them, send them home from the clinic, um, offer them surgery or say, hey, you know, your seizures are under control. Why don't we just hold off for a little while? What do you guys think? So surgery is a good option, and I agree. Surgery is definitely uh, needed in this case. How soon would you guys do surgery? Would you rush them to the operating room right now? Is it emergent, urgent, or can it be done in a few weeks to a month? Okay, somebody said as soon as possible. So, you know, the answer to this is it doesn't need to be emergent, okay? So this is a patient who's had this probably for years now. It just kept growing and growing. It looks like a meningioma, which are typically benign lesions. They're slow growing lesions. And if they are small and in this area, you know, and not causing any neurological changes, then you wouldn't offer surgery for them. Unfortunately, this patient has a large lesion that is invasive and it is causing seizures for this patient or leading to seizures in this, in this patient. Fortunately for her, she has no focal neurological deficits. This is where you sit down and you have a candid conversation with the patient and say, hey, there's a tumor here. It's something that we can easily take out with surgery. It's accessible. It's right over the super, superficial surface of the brain itself. It's something that we can take out. I can't promise you a gross total resection because it invades into the superior sagittal sinus, which is a major drainage pattern for the brain itself. And damaging that can lead to significant uh, morbidity, depending on where you go into. Um, there are also several blood vessels that go around the tumor itself that can lead to um, stroke if we were to do surgery. If you were not to do surgery, then this will keep growing and you will continue to have these seizures even though they're controlled with the medication. Um, it may lead, end up being to the point where you start having focal deficits that are not just seizures. How soon will that happen? Don't really know how quickly it would happen, but it's been going on for years. But with the changes that you see in here and the invasiveness, invasiveness of it, I think surgery is really the best option for you. You go over the pros, the cons, and I'm pretty blunt and honest with my patients. Um, and I let them know what I think is best for them and what I think that they can do. And I've had patients who've come in with small, tiny little meningiomas. Oh, I fell, hit my head and I got a scan of the head and it showed a meningioma, but it's very small and it doesn't need to be taken out because they are slow growing. And so we just follow these with serial imaging with repeated MRIs every so often, um, six months to a year or several years down the road. And if you remain stable, you kind of leave it as is. Um, and so in this patient, I would actually recommend surgery for them. Now, the key thing to note is that this lesion is in an area where if you were to go after it surgically, um, the supplementary motor area runs right through there. And so you can have something called an SMA syndrome, which can lead to difficulty talking immediately after surgery with associated weakness as well. So we took the patient to the operating room. We did a craniotomy for tumor. Uh, this is myself here with my resident, Dr. Hugh. 
Um, and you can see that we're taking this almost golf ball sized lesion um, that is well circumscribed and it's just coming out very nicely and came out very, very well with the planes really nicely intact. Um, like I told the patient, it was not a gross total resection because I did not want to invade into the uh, wall of that sinus and cause significant bleeding, which can also lead to death in these patients. Um, patient did well. She woke up and the pathology came back as World Health Organization grade two meningioma, which is a slightly more invasive form of a meningioma. And she actually needed to get um, some adjuvant therapy afterwards. On her post-op exam immediately, she had some transient weakness on the right side of her body immediately post-op. And at one month follow-up, the patient then came back to her full strength and was walking on her own. Um, so she had what we call SMA syndrome and patients typically do pretty well if they develop that. What questions do you guys have? Could you use chemo to shrink it? Not at that size and not for this type of tumor. There are other types of tumors such as um, some metastatic tumors that you can do um, chemotherapy for and or radiation therapy for um, and actually shrink those down pretty nicely, but not for this meningioma. Are the odds of recurrence high? Well, you know, it's not about recurrence because there's still some tumor there. It's more about how quickly it's going to grow back and the likelihood of it growing back pretty quickly is low. Um, just because it's a meningioma and those are pretty benign tumors. And she also is going to undergo adjuvant therapy to help treat that area. So it decreases the likelihood of, 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 um, of recurrence. So good question. Was a tumor causing the seizure? So not the tumor itself, but the mass effect from the tumor pushing on the rest of the brain, thereby, um, inhibiting the normal function of the signaling that goes across the neurons, right? So that's what led to the seizures and the swelling around that area. Was she only, why was she only prescribed meds to sort of further image in her test? So the person who worked this patient up actually, I think did a good job in that they immediately sent her out to a neurosurgeon after seeing the CT scan. And that was the workup for her, right? You get the CT scan, you see the, the lesion, you send them to the neurosurgeon because you think it's a big tumor. And while they're there with the neurosurgeon, they get the MRI scan and get it taken care of. So she got her MRI scan the same day that she came in to see us in clinic. Um, did she have to do physical therapy or rehabilitation? Um, so she did have to do physical therapy, quite a bit of physical therapy, and actually went to some rehab um, and did very well after that. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure she got her scan right before she came up to see us in clinic. And we typically do that when you're at a large center, you're able to get patients to the MRI scanner on the same day as their clinic appointment. So it works out very well. And if you're not able to, you're able to set up an appointment for them to get their MRI scan and then have those images transferred over to you through the cloud. So you can actually see it when they're here in clinic. All right. So let's keep going here. We got a couple more. So let's talk about spine, right? So we talked about the brain. Those are typical things that we do. But what about the spine, right? Penfield is all about the brain. I'm all about the spine. Um, so you got this 67-year-old male, comes in with two years of right lower extremity pain, numbness, and tingling in the L4, L5, and S1 distribution, as well as low back pain. You're like, uh, what, what does all that mean? L4, L5, and S1? We'll talk about that. Um, they're full strength in all extremities when you examine them in clinic, but they have some decreased sensation of light touch in the right lower extremity. You send them for this EMG, uh, which is a uh, test for nerve dysfunction or radiculopathy, as well as peripheral nerve dysfunction, and it confirms an L4, L5, and S1 radiculopathy. So what do you want to do next? So let's go back to this. So what are these L4, L5, and S1. So those are the nerve roots that travel in the fecal sac and go down to the lower extremity. So you have your L4 nerve root, your L5 nerve root, and S1 nerve root. And each nerve root innervates a dermatome, which we've actually mapped out in the human body. You can actually um, identify these dermatomes in clinic and their specialized, their specific areas on the lower extremity on the torso and in the upper extremities where these nerve roots travel and provide innervation to those areas, to the skin itself, and sometimes to the muscles that run in that area as well. 
Um, so if you were to be able to identify these dermatomes, you can theoretically trace back to the spine where you think the pathology is. So based on the description of the patient, I could tell you that they have an L4, L5, and S1 radiculopathy, which means that I think that this is a problem of the nerve root itself. The good news is this patient's full strength. Um, so what do you want to do next? So before we go into that, there was a question in the chat that said, how does the brain readjust to the extra space to the skull in the skull after the meningioma is removed? So the brain itself will try to fill up that space either with fluid or try to expand its volume to fill up that area that the tumor was in. So if the, two, if the compression has been there for a long time, then the brain is not going to expand fully. So you're going to have fluid that builds up in that area. But if the compression was only there for a short time, the brain typically expands into that space. All right. So what do you want? Spinal MRI. I like it. So spinal MRI with contrast, without contrast, what are you thinking? So with contrast is a good idea. Most spinal MRIs, when you first see somebody in clinic are typically without contrast, unless you think that the patient has a tumor. So most of the times that we get scans with contrast is if we're worried about a tumor itself. Uh, but here we're talking about radiculopathy, uh, which is again, nerve root dysfunction on one side of the body in an older male, um, with pain, numbness, and tingling. So in my head, the first thing I think about is nerve root compression. So I typically will get an MRI without contrast for these patients uh, because using contrast in these patients doesn't really add more to the diagnosis unless I'm suspicious of some type of a tumor in that area, which again, in this type of patient, you wouldn't really be suspicious for a tumor here. So let's see what the MRI shows. So before we do that, let's talk dermatomes again. And so each nerve root runs in its typically uh, typical respective distribution, providing innervation to the skin in that area. And so you can trace back where each nerve root's coming from. So when you say L4, the patient had some patchy numbness running down in this area, L5 down to the top of the foot, and S1 around the lateral aspect of the foot um, going down into the bottom of the foot itself. So you can try to follow these nerves back to the spine um, based on just the examination and the history. And, you know, people were operating on the spine before MRIs were done. We're just very fortunate to have MRIs available to us so that we can actually see where those nerves are actually compressed and are not just going off of our physical examination. But if you do a really good physical examination, you can identify the areas of compression and be able to pinpoint that in a patient just in the clinical uh, scenario. So this is the MRI of the lumbar spine. And so this is again, an MRI without contrast. And this is a sagittal view, which is different from something that we've seen so far. And you can see over here, these are the vertebral bodies. Uh, blocks just kind of sit on top of each other and in between each vertebral body is a disc. You can see how the disc here is pretty flattened out. And over here, it's completely flattened out. Going all the way to the other side. And so let's go back through this one more time. So let's kind of get a midline cut there. So these are the vertebral bodies. In between these vertebral bodies, a disc that should be nice and tall. And you can see this patient's discs are flattened out here and flattened out here. And you can see here that there's some compression here in the spine itself. Um, these are the spinous processes behind here. The white that you see here is a fecal sac with spinal fluid running through it. And you can see this wispy tendrils running down. Those are the nerve roots themselves. They try to exit out the foramen. So let's go over here. And you can see over here how that's tight there where that nerve is trying to exit out and tighten all those other areas as well. So the most symptomatic for this patient was L4, L5, and S1. So what do you guys want to do? Do you want to send them home and say, hey, you know, this happens, you're getting older, there's nothing we can do for this. Do you want to send them for some physical therapy? Uh, I want to do some more workup like the EMG or maybe get some injections. Or do you want to set them to have just conservative therapy with massages, steroid injections, physical therapy, that kind of stuff? What do you guys think?
Okay, injections, I like it. Talk to the patient about what they want, get some further workup, all of the above. That, those are all absolutely appropriate. So when, I, when it comes to back pain and radiculopathy, I really have an intense conversation with each patient. I see what they've done so far to get to where they're at and what they've tried and what they haven't tried. If they haven't tried anything and they're seeing me in clinic, I send them out to go get something done unless I see something really egregious on their scan that needs to be taken to the operating room. And even then, I still send them to get some kind of workup done to further pinpoint it and make sure that it is accurate um, area that I'm going to be operating on. So there are several things you can do. One is determine if this is emergent or non-emergent. This is non-emergent. So I don't need to rush anybody to the operating room today, in the next week, or probably even in the next month, two months, six months or even in a year, okay? However, I don't want this patient living with this issue for longer than they have to. So what I typically do is I send them for further workup, like an EMG to further pinpoint where the nerve roots are compressed. So the EMG showed it was L4, L5, and S1. So that confirms where I see it on the MRI. And then I, I'll sometimes send them for what we call the uh, selective nerve root block, where the um, interventional radiologists or interventional anesthesiologists actually go in and inject um, some numbing medication and some steroids over the nerve root itself to see if that will help alleviate some of the pain and tingling that they're having. And the patients find it successful where they are doing very well without significant pain. And that tells me that that is the exact area that the compression is coming from. And that, again, three things to tell me that this is where I need to operate on. Next question you ask the patient is, do you want surgery, right? Because you're coming to a surgical clinic and majority of patients don't want surgery. So then you have to have that conversation with them of, well, if you don't want surgery, what can we do to help you out here? Um, so you can send them for some more injections, such as lumbar epidural steroid injections, which are not as specific to the site of the diagnostic test that we talked about, but allow for some steroids to go into the fecal sac and decrease some of the inflammation that occurs from the compression of the nerve roots themselves. We can send them to do more physical therapy to help find stretching exercises or motion exercises to help them uh, alleviate some of the pain and numbness and uh, uh, tingling that they're, they're having. You can send them to get massages done to help with spasms if they have spasms. Um, there's several things that you can do for these patients, including chronic pain management with medications such as opioid medications or NSAIDs even, they may help the patient. Uh, but none of these are going to take away the compression that you see there. None of these are going to fix the nerve roots themselves. And some patients can get good relief with those conservative management for years even. But at some point, it typically comes down to if there's something on the MRI and there, you can pinpoint it with these other tests, then it most likely needs surgery. And so you have a conversation with the patient about the goals of surgery and what kind of surgery you want to do. This is multi-levels. Um, and it involves compression of the nerve roots. So you want to decompress those nerve roots. And the only way to do that is to remove uh, portions of the spine itself that we allow for you to take off the pressure off of those nerve roots. And this involves doing what we call a spine fusion. So, so what somebody asked, what would happen if this was never treated or addressed? The biggest thing that would happen is the patient would continue to be in pain with the numbness and tingling that would get progressively worse over the years. It's very rare to, to get um, a complete deficit from degenerative spine disease, but there are patients who will then develop weakness over time. And if you start developing weakness, then it starts to become a pretty significant problem that is very debilitating. And it's very hard to get weakness back, get the strength back if you start developing weakness or if you develop uh, a paralysis from compression of the nerve root that's going to that muscle itself. So what do we do? We decided to do a transferaminal spinal, uh, transferaminal lumbar inner body fusion with the spine robot, my buddy named Rex over here. Um, so Rex and I do spine surgery. Um, I like to call it virtual surgery. Um, and so what this allows us to do is to place screws into the spine itself to help stabilize the spine because we're going to destabilize the spine by taking all of those posterior elements out that help to hold your spine together. So we put screws in there and then we take out those intervertebral discs that are compressing those nerves themselves and take out those joints that are compressing those nerves that have been become overgrown. And we take all of those out and we put what we call grafts in place to help 
hold the spine together, uh, but also to promote fusion in that area so that we can help elevate the areas where the nerves are are coming out, the foraminal stenosis to help remove that um, and allow for freedom of those nerves as they travel through those foramina, for, foramen. Um, so that is typically what we'll do in, in, for those types of fusions. Now, robotic spine surgery has been around for a while now, but is now being more widely adopted. It's a pretty slick way to do surgery, and it's something that we're still trying to figure out how best to use for our patients. And there's some people doing some phenomenal things out there with robotic spine surgery. So we fuse the patient, we got uh, grafts in there, decompressed the nerves, and the patient woke up, had some physical therapy, uh, was up and walking about, and uh, did very well post-op. He remained full strength, spent about four days in the hospital, was discharged home. At one month follow-up, he had complete resolution of his right lower extremity pain and tingling. Um, his numbness was improved, but not resolved. And that's what I typically tell patients, like you're your numbness is typically the last thing that we see go, uh, that we see improve over time. But most people, it's the pain and the tingling that gets better first. How many hours is typical surgery type of surgery typically last? It all depends. Um, to do a one level surgery, you're probably looking at about two hours, two and a half hours to do that operating time. Uh, to do a two level surgery, probably add another 45 minutes to an hour. So looking about three hours, pushing on four hours for a two level surgery. What does the robot help you do? So the robot helps you accurately place your screws. And there are several ways to place these screws. Um, you can do it with fluoroscopy where you take x-rays each time that you go ahead and place your screw. Um, and that's a lot of radiation that you're taking an x-ray with every shot that you try to place a screw in. You can deal with CT guided navigation where you take an intraoperative CT and then try to navigate into the, the uh, pedicle, which is the part of the, verte uh, of the uh, vertebra that will allow, part of the spine that will allow for purchase of the screws themselves. Um, or you can, and, and that's done by freehand, so you're using your own hands to do it. Um, or you can use it with the robot. And what the robot allows you to do is it helps you to pre-plan your surgery so you can plan the construct that you want to use, how, uh, where you want to place your screws ahead of time, and it allows you to place those screws pretty quickly. The downside of the robot is that it takes time to set it up and get things going in the operating room. So once things start moving, the screw placement is pretty fast. The accuracy is pretty much close to, uh, or even better than um, doing it by freehand and definitely better than doing it by fluoroscopy. What are the grafts made of? So grafts can be made off of multiple things and each uh, spine surgeon weighs the pros and cons of what type of graft that they'll use. Um, the current grafts that we use now are elevate cages that are expandable grafts. Um, there are also different grafts that are made of pure titanium um, that you can place in there as well. Um, there are many different companies that make grafts. So it used to be in the past that people would take part of um, iliac crest, or they'll take part of the fibula and put that in there as part of their construct. We don't do that anymore. Uh, it's pretty painful, but some people uh, may need it done. What factors do you look at in infusion of the lumbar spine that can cause added stress to the muscle and other vertebrae and cause future issues? That is a very good question. What I typically tell patients is that when you fuse a segment of the spine, you've basically taken two segments that are supporting your spine and basically turn it into one. So the load sharing is increased on that area. And so what that means then is that the other parts of the spine have to pick up that load sharing, uh, which leads to further degeneration in the spine over time. So there's a risk that you may need further spine surgery as time progresses. Now, that risk is low, but it's still there. And so you have to be honest with your patients that that is a risk they may need further spine surgery. The majority of patients do very well from this surgery. And so when you look at the risk versus the benefits, the benefits typically outweigh the risk of a 10-year um, going back to the operating room to help um, the adjacent segment of the spine. Um, how long does it take to, or how long do you expect it to take for the numbness to resolve? That's a tough question because nobody really knows. I don't know. Uh, maybe there's somebody out there who actually really knows, but I honestly don't know how long it takes for the numbness to resolve. Everybody's different. There are some patients, um, like one of the patients I did today, 
they woke up from surgery and they're like, my numbness is gone. And then there are other patients who will come back and see you at six months and say, my numbness is still there. And there are other patients who will come back to you at one month and say, you know, part of it's gone, but it's better, but it's still there. So it's very hard to tell you exactly how long I expect it to take for the numbness to resolve. What I do tell patients is that if at one year your numbness is not gone, the likelihood of it, go of it being resolved is very, very low to none. All good questions. Let's talk about microscopic spine. So now you have another guy who's coming in with weakness in his right upper extremity, his right in his arm, as well as numbness and tingling with pain shooting into his right first three digits, the right side greater than the left. Okay, so when you see something like that, it's shooting in a distribution. You think of radiculopathy, something going on with the nerve roots. The right side's worse than the left, so you're thinking maybe there's some right-sided compression that's worse than on the left side. The patient's examination, so you got your history, now you have to go examine the patient. That's a very important part of being a neurosurgeon. Patient's neurologically intact, except for decreased sensation. The C7 dermatome, again, you try to identify where is the pathology, and they also have some four out of five weakness in their right triceps and grip, which means they're not full strength. So there's a deficit somewhere in the triceps and also in grip. So now you ask, you're sitting in clinic, you're like, oh, I'm the intern. What is, what is the nerve that goes to the triceps? I got to figure this out. Um, and what nerve root innervates the triceps? So you look at that and you look at it. All right, C6, C7 goes to the triceps, some C8 as well. Um, you know, and so you, you go back and try to pinpoint exactly where everything is before you do the question I'm asking you next is, so what do you do next? Now that you've pinpointed where things are, what do you want to do to confirm that you're actually correct? Spinal MRI without contrast. Correct. See? So what part of the spine? Do you want the whole spine? Do you want the cervical spine in the neck? Do you want the lumbar spine like we saw in the last one or the thoracic spine that we haven't seen yet? What are you guys thinking? Cervical spine, correct. Um, so cervical spine. So let's get an MRI of the cervical spine. Do you wanna do it stat? Do you wanna say, well, come back and see me in a few weeks. We'll get the MRI and we'll see about how things are going. What are you guys thinking? Not emerging. That's correct. So it's a trick question because most 99.99% of my patients that come to clinic need to have an MRI before they come into my clinic. So I'm already seeing the MRI at that time point. But by the time that they get to my clinic and by the time the MRI is scheduled, some weeks have gone by from when they saw their primary care physician who ordered the MRI, got, then they got the MRI and the primary care physician calls them to say, hey, go to see the neurosurgeon. I set up a consult for you with the neurosurgeon. So most of the patients that you'll see in neurosurgery should already have these films. And if they don't, you just send them to go get the films the same day or as soon as they can. So what do you do next? You get the cervical spine MRI. So let's take a look at that. So this is a cervical spine MRI. This is the sagittal view without contrast. This is the axial view without contrast. Um, you can see the vertebral bodies here. You can see modic changes in the vertebral bodies, which are signs of degeneration in the spine. You can see the intervertebral discs here. Um, you can see that they're collapsed down throughout most of the levels in the spine. You can see the scalloping and herniation of discs into the vertebral body itself, like a Schmerl's node and degeneration of the spine itself. You can see the spinal cord running through here as this dark gray cord, and you see the white around it, that's the cerebral spinal fluid. You can see the spinous processes in the posterior aspect of the spine. And again, you can see on the axial cut, um, the vertebral body here, which is a cross section of this, the spinal cord here, which you see here, and then the spinal fluid around it, which is 
diminished, right? So if we go through this and we take a look at each level, you can see that at C6, C7, C6, C7 for Raymond, you can see that on the right side, that nerve is compressed there, but on the left side, it kind of opens up a little bit. Um, and so what you then tell the patient is that, well, what nerve exits here? Um, and it's a trick question because it's actually the C7 nerve root because the in the cervical spine, the nerve that exits, um, the, the nerve that exits is actually not the name, not named after the vertebral body that it's exiting now. It's named after the vertebral body below it. So the if you're exiting at the C6 vertebral body, C6, C7, then it's going to be the C7 nerve root that's exiting now. Um, and so the patient has compression of this nerve root here, but they also have compression at the level above. At C5, 6, they have some compression there. It's not significant, but it's still enough for us to say that there's something there. And it also fits the injections that they got and also fits the EMG that they got and also fits the physical examination that you have there. So what do you offer this patient that has compression of the nerve root um, with physical examination sign of weakness and an MRI showing um, nerve root compression. What are you guys thinking? Do you wanna send them for more physical therapy? Do you want to send them some more injections? Yeah, steroid injections. That's always an option for a patient. Um, in this case, I would not send this patient for a cervical epidural steroid injection. Does anybody know why I would hold off on doing that? That's okay. So the reason why I would hold off on doing that is because the patient has weakness, right? So the patient's weak, so send them for more steroid injections is really not going to fix their weakness that is seen on examination. So it's not like the patient's telling you that they're weak, but then when you test them, they're actually fully strong, but they're actually weak on examination. Somebody says surgery to decompress. Absolutely. This is the right step for the patient is to go to surgery. They've already failed physical therapy, which isn't helping them get any stronger. They've gotten the selective nerve root block to pinpoint where the area of the lesions at, and the EMG correlates to what you're seeing on the MRI findings and your physical examination. So you have four different things that are telling you where to go and where the compression's at. So your goal is to do surgery to decompress. So you can do surgery in one of two ways. One way you can do surgery is you can try doing surgery from the front of the spine and coming down over here, taking out the disc and opening up the posterior longitudinal ligament and decompressing the fecal sac and decompressing the nerve roots, right, into the foramen. And you do it at both levels, or you can try to come from the back, take off all of these bones here, the spinous processes, the lamina, and try to do foraminotomies from the back. I would not recommend doing anything from the back for this patient because this is mostly foraminal stenosis at multiple levels. The dissection to come from the back involves cutting multiple muscles and it's more painful for the patient. Um, and you don't get as much of a decompression and stabilization as you would if you came from the front. So coming from the front of the neck is called an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. So here we go. So this is the surgery itself. I'll play a little clip of me doing the procedure here. So you can see, I'm going to pause this right here. This is one vertebral body. That's the other one here. So this is C5, C6, C7 is down here. You can see right here, this um, um, uh, disc material that sits here, and this is the bone. And I've taken out the disc material at this level, C5, 6, and I'm just kind of cleaning the rest of the disc off of the vertebral body until I get down to those osteophytes, the bony uh, protrusions on the posterior aspect of the spine itself. 
And this is all a dissection through the neck itself. So I'm taking a curette and I'm cleaning off the rest of that disc and I take a drill and I drill right over where those bony um, osteophytes are posteriorly all the way towards the foramen itself, decompressing, um, doing the bony decompression, I should say. And you have to be very careful here because guess what's right below you? Once you get through the thin ligament and the disc, um, it's the spinal cord. So right there, I'm gonna go back just a smidge. So that's uh, uh, curette, and right underneath there, that's the ligament that I'm going underneath, and then I take a nerve hook. Uh, here we go. And I take a nerve hook to go underneath there, and I pull that up, and you can kind of see that right there, that shiny um, ligament there, and that's how you know that you're the posterior longitudinal ligament itself. So I get underneath that because I need to really decompress where those nerves are coming out of. Um, so I have to expose the, the thecal sac itself and the, and, and the dura itself, right? So then I take a kerosene and I bite across that, taking out the remainder of those osteophytes. And right there is where you see the dura. See how shiny that is? That's the dura itself. And this is all under the microscope. And then I bite out to the foramen where those nerves are exiting out of, and I really free that up. And what happens is you see that flash of blood that comes out there. That's the epidural venous plexus there. And that tells me that I am all the way through in that area. And I take a nerve hook and a curette into that foramen to really ensure the nerve is free. So somebody asked me a question of how well am I able to see what's happening? So I'm actually looking through a microscope. So I'm very, very much able to see well, um, quite well, actually, better than I would with my own eyes. Um, and Rex, unfortunately, is not helping me out this case. This is not a case that Rex is indicated for. Um, I like to hang out with Rex, but Rex, but I like to hang out with Rex when it's indicated. Um, and then what I do is replace this titanium grafts in here uh, with some of the patient's own bone and some other um, 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 allograft to help for bony fusion. Um, and that allows for fusion across that space. Now, somebody asked a really great question about Horner's syndrome. So you are worried about Horner's syndrome with this surgery and the fact that when you are dissecting under these muscles called the longus coli muscles um, along the anterior portion of the vertebral body, um, there are nerves that run in there, for the sympathetic plexus that can lead to a Horner syndrome. Does anybody know what Horner syndrome is? Yeah, not really damage the facial nerves. Typically, um, what what do you guys think it is? One part of their face doesn't really sweat. One of their eyelids is really droopy and it's all on the same side. The face becomes really cherry red on that side. And then they have a meiotic pupil, okay? So those are the three things that you look for in patient with Horner syndrome. All right, so now... Um, the longest coli muscle, let's point them out to you. See if I can find a good cut of the longest coli. I can't really find a good cut of the longest coli here, but they are actually underneath here um, and underneath there. Yep. Um, so that's where they are. The, my the little, um, what I use to remember Horner syndrome is MAP meiosis, anhydrosis, and ptosis. So the ptosis is the drooping of the eyelid, the meiotic pupil, and then anhydrosis, okay? So you go in, you've taken out the disc themselves, you decompress each of the nerve roots, you put your grafts in there to maintain the height of the disc space and to, to restore the height of the disc space and to restore the height of the foramen itself, thereby further decompressing the nerves. Um, you take all your retractors out, and you put a plate across that um, and you secure that plate with screws. So the black specks in the vertebral body are where the bone was 
bleeding from. And so I take a little bit of electrocautery over those areas and I kind of um, use monopolar cautery over the bleeder itself to help stop the bleeding. If that doesn't work. Then I put some bone wax over it, which I actually did in this case several times, put some bone wax around it to kind of hold, um, to seal up the areas that the bone was bleeding from. There are several tricks to, to doing these cases. Um, the one word of wisdom I'll tell you is that all bleeding stops, either you stop it or they continue and the patient stops this on their own, which is not good. So you place this plate across to help secure everything together and you put screws in there and you get a picture at the end of the case that kind of looks like this. You see the spine, you see your grafts, you see your screws and you see your plate coming across there. So conclusion, uh, these are the bread and butter cases of neurosurgery. Um, even though to me, these are typical and technically routine cases, they're still exciting. Every time I wake up and go to the operating room, I'm very happy to be there. Um, and to our patients, they're anything but routine. Their lives are in your hands. And it's very true. You're millimeters away from the spinal cord in some of these cases, and you're right in the brain in some of these cases as well. Um, and now I'll open it up to any questions that you guys may have. Um, I do have one joke to tell you guys. Um, and it's, it's probably a terrible joke and corny joke, but, um, when my favorite joke to tell patients is uh, whenever a patient comes in after getting the skull taken off and we get to put their skull back on, I go up to them and say, hey, I just want to let you know that after your surgery is done, um, you're not going to be as open minded anymore. Um, and then they chuckle and I chuckle and it's great. There we go. Anybody have any other questions? What does my typical day look like? Well, my typical day now is actually pretty good. Uh, I'm the chief resident at our veterans hospital. In the past year, I was chief resident at our community hospital, Eskenazi Health. And um, as a chief, you're in charge of the the entire service for that hospital that you're at. And so most of the days I'll get in around 6.30, uh, 6 a.m., 6.30, 7 a.m. Uh, my team is already here and they're already seeing our patients. I lead them on rounds. We go see all of our patients. We go over the cases. We go over the films and then go to the operating room where I operate all day long and my day ends when my operations are done or if traumas are coming in. And so uh, my days are actually pretty good. And then when I'm on call, I take home calls. So I'm not in the hospital all the time. Now, <clears throat> that's very atypical for the, uh, for the neurosurgery resident because the majority of your neurosurgery years are spent as the junior resident. So your junior resident years are you're in the hospital very early in the morning. You're rounding and seeing all the patients. You're seeing consults during the day. You're going to the operating room trying to operate. You're in clinic as well. And so and you're taking in-house call, which is 24 hours or sorry, 28 hour call um, every so often, depending on the call schedule. So it can be very, very busy. Uh, but as a chief resident, you take on a little more of the clinical responsibility um, and also a lot more of the leadership responsibility. So it's that trade off of the hours stuck in the hospital versus the hours just taking care of the team. Um, how many hours do you spend in the clinic or the operating room? It really depends on the case and on the week. If it's a one level anterior cervical discectomy infusion, and that's my only case for today, then I'm probably spending about an hour, hour and a half in the operating room. Um, and then my day's done unless something comes in. Um, I have clinic twice a week and that goes from 8 a.m. till 3 or 4 p.m., depending on how late patients get there. Um, and then if it's a really busy operative day, then I'm stuck here until the day is done and you do the surgery and take care of your patients and do the best that you can until you get to go home. And if I'm on call and something comes in the middle of the night, I have to get up and come in and take care of that at the hospital. So um, your hours do vary from time to time. You are stuck in the hospital a lot as a junior resident and you basically 
what resident means is that you are living in the hospital and that is how it is in your junior year. So as you become a senior, you start evolving more in leadership and not um, being on the floor. Um, did I debate ortho as well since you like to focus on spine? Actually, I thought more about doing shoulder <laughs> than spine uh, when I did think about ortho. And that was when I was in um, early first year of med school and also um, in undergrad. When I decided I was going to go into medical school, I initially thought I was going to either be an uh, internal medicine doctor, neurologist, or orthopedic spine surgeon. And I'm none of those. I'm a neurosurgeon now. So you can definitely change at any time and do anything that you want in medicine or surgery. You just have to decide, do you wanna do medicine or do you wanna do surgery? How well would the GSW patient return their cognitive function? That's always tough to say because traumatic brain injury is more diffused than the impact that you see on the scan. Um, so, that patient was able to communicate with their family, albeit they were aphasic, so they weren't able to communicate that well, but they could understand what people were telling them to do, and they could interact with their family. Um, they didn't regain significant function on their right side of their body, uh, just from the trauma that occurred, but they were able to mobilize with their left side and able to perform some daily activities. And so, you know, you can take somebody from basically being comatose and get them to some level of functionality. Um, you don't always get them to hundred percent functionality. What about you specifically do you feel has allowed you to excel in medicine and thrive in neurosurgery? Um, you know, it's a, it's a very good question. I think the traits that I would say to allow people, um, including myself, to excel and also to thrive is, you know, having good integrity, being good at communicating with people. Um, Obviously, the clinical skills are very, very important, but that's not all of it. You can be taught how to do neurosurgery. Anybody can be taught how to do neurosurgery. It's more about choosing the right patients, working with a good team, and collaborating well with others that makes people excel in anything that they do, and especially neurosurgery. You can be the smartest person in the room, but if you can't collaborate well, communicate well, or work well with your patients, you're not going to excel as well as those who do that. Um, and obviously studying hard, right? Everybody has to study. How inaccurate is Gray's Anatomy? Uh, <laughs> it's very inaccurate, but it's a great show. I mean, I used to watch Grey's Anatomy in undergrad and in med school. Even now, I still watch a few show, uh, a few episodes once in a while. Uh, but I do think that there are a lot of inaccuracies, but it's fun. I mean, my favorite game is to sit down and watch Grey's Anatomy and find out all the inaccuracies in it and chat, chat it up with some of my friends. Uh, but it's still a fun show. It's good drama, I would say. What happens if you have to use the bathroom mid-surgery? Well, you know, most of us just wear a diaper. No, I'm joking. Um, so typically, if you have to use a ba the bathroom mid-surgery, um, you just call your staff in or call your resident in to come in and, and you know, take over the case and watch the patient while you go. But um, I've never had to go use the bathroom mid-surgery. Um, I've had to go use the bathroom in between cases, but mid-surgery, you typically just kind of hold it in and finish the case and then go use the bathroom. But if you, if you have to go, you have to go. You just, the most important thing is making sure that the patient is safe at that time point. You don't leave the surgery if it's a critical portion of the case. Uh, but if you have a dual surgeon team, then yeah, one of you can scrub out and go use the restroom and come back and finish the case. So how do you balance work and life as a resident? Um, you know, I, people talk about work-life balance. I'm more of, uh, uh, how do I put it this way? When people talk about work-life balance, they think of work as bad and life is good. I think of both as good. Um, so I don't really think of it as a balance per se, right? But I do think that you need to be able to interact with your friends and with your family and take time off to see other people outside of neurosurgery. Otherwise, you will get burnt out when you're working, you know, 80 hour weeks and whatnot. And so the ACGME, the accrediting body for graduate medical education, um, 
have an 80 hour work week rule. We also get four weeks of vacation here to allow you to kind of decompress. I have friends that I go out to get beers with or hang out with when I'm not working. Um, you get a weekend off, you go see your family, you talk to your friends on the phone. I still talk to my med school buddies and undergrad buddies um, on the phone just about every week actually. And there are friends that I interact with every week that are, you know, family to me. And there's my family as well. I see my younger brother every day because he lives with me. Um, that's about it. Uh, what, how do you deal with burnout? That's a very good question. You know, it's tough. Neurosurgery is not an easy road. You are working hard every day. Even on the days where you don't have a ton of cases, you're still working hard because you're trying to catch up on your research. You're trying to catch up on reading. You're trying to catch up on life, right? Um, and so it's not something that's easy. And so the way you deal with burnout is by having a good support system around you. At least that's what I think is the way to deal with it. So I have friends, my friends, Natasha and Nabila and their husbands, they will... If they haven't heard from me for a while, they will text me and say, hey, we're having barbecue this time. You need to come in and get some food and we'll package it up for you so you can run over here, grab food, say hi real quick and run back. You know, um, so having the support system around you is very, very important. What's the longest surgery you've performed? Oh, um, Man, uh, I think the longest that I performed started at around 8.30 a.m. And I didn't get done until 9 or 10 p.m. that night. So it was a very, very long surgery. And it was a huge, huge tumor. Most of the days, um, most cases typically last a few hours. They're not really super long cases because you don't want somebody under general anesthesia for that long. And there are some cases where there are certain parts to it where you do the aneurysm clipping and then you'll take the patient to the angiography and to an angiography suite and where they get an angiogram so you can see you know, if there is, you know, if you clip the aneurysm correctly, if you took off a collateral blood vessel. Um, and then if that happens, or if it doesn't look like it's, you know, completely clipped and you got to take them back to the operating room, or you do the angiogram in the operating room while you're, while you're there. So there are certain parts of the, to the case that take longer and there's certain parts that take short, that are shorter. Um, it all depends on what you're doing and what facility you're in and how big of a case it is. Do your hands ever shake in a particularly stressful surgery? Everybody's hands shake. I drink coffee. I love coffee. Um, there are tools that you can do to prevent your hands from shaking. Um, the longer you go without eating, the more your hands are going to shake, the more stressful the surgery is, and the more your hands are going to shake. Um, I think my hands are pretty steady, but when you're under the microscope, every small movement looks like a gigantic leap across space. Um, so you just kind of figure out ways to place your arms by your side, you know, hold the instrument a certain way place your hand on the patient, place your hand on a tool uh, that some surgeons will have on there like um, to help allow for their hands to be steady during surgery. Breathing techniques, there are different things that I do at least to prevent my hands from shaking. Uh, but what I do find is that once you're going through the motion of doing surgery, your hands tend not to shake um, and everybody's different in and how their, their hands perform. All right, any other questions? I think those were all the questions for now. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to answer them all. We really, really appreciate it. Not a problem, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me. And thank you for such a wonderful presentation. The cases were so interesting and everyone learned so much. We really, really appreciate it. Of course. Again, this is just a general overview of neurosurgery and what we do on a daily basis. So if that makes you guys excited and you love it, then you should definitely do neurosurgery. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for everyone watching, the link to the Google form has been posted in the chat box and will be posted in the description of this video shortly. 
And please fill that out within the next 30 minutes so we can receive verification of your attendance. And please remember that the April roundup um, will begin this coming Friday evening at 11.59 p.m. Eastern and will end um, this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern as well. And to learn more about our monthly roundups, please check out the roundup tab on our website or our Instagram highlight. And once again, thank you so, so much. This was a fabulous presentation.